All right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Charles Nebeze, and I'm the Vice President of Business Development and Commercialization with the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation. And uh, I'm very pleased to welcome you to our webinar today, where we're going to be talking to you about introducing the whole world of space mining to what's happening at Terrestrial. So I want to connect earth mining and space mining, in particular, what's happening on the moon. Um, with me today is a team from CSA and also a team from Semimica who will be uh, joining us to present to you. Uh, but before I go forward, I want to acknowledge that uh, I'm broadcasting here as host from the traditional lands of the Atikmashen Anishinaabeg, which is the Whitefish First Nation, which is right here in the Sudbury area. Uh, so a couple of uh, rules of engagement for today. If you would like to um, ask a question, please type your question in the chat box and we'll be able to read those questions out. We are also going to provide a copy of this recording to you afterwards. Uh, in terms of uh, the slides, they'll also be provided as well. Q&A, you can raise your hand at the Q&A time and we'll be able to, uh, to, to uh, unmute you so that you can ask, ask your question. Uh, we've got representation on the webinar from across Canada and some also international people on the call. So very excited about, uh, about that as well. So to move forward with the webinar now, uh, what, this is the agenda that we'll be following uh, throughout the, the next hour or so. Uh, we'll obviously give you a reason why we are meeting with you today. Uh, and at a high level, we do want to make that connection between terrestrial mining and what's happening on the, on, on the moon. As you all know, Canada is going back, is going to the moon, or back is going to the moon, and we'll have a presence uh, on the moon within the next few years. And also we'll be explaining to you why it is that we are involved in these initiatives as the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation and also as the MICA network. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then we'll describe to you what is the Artemis program. For those of you who don't know, we'll give you an understanding of what that's all about. And then the last thing I want to say is that, uh, you know, there are conditions on the moon that I think we sh you should be aware of. And we'll explain those to you as well. And then we'll kind of close off with giving you some opportunities and some of the barriers that we need to overcome uh, to move things forward. So as you can see here, there are some things happening right now in terms of uh, Luna. Uh, we are going to be going back to the moon in 2024. We'll do a flyby mission over the moon. And then in 2025, we actually want to land people on the moon. So the whole idea is around lunar mining and lunar resource uh, exploration and taking advantage of resources on the moon is going to happen uh, for sure in the very short term. In terms of uh, just timelines on going to the moon, um, interesting fact is um, all the times that we've been to the moon, we've only been on the moon for up to a maximum of 72 hours. Uh, and so, it, and it's again, because of resources to bring down to the moon, there's not been, been that many resources. But the vision that we have for the future is to spend a bit more time on the moon. So in other words, we're looking at a 6.5 day uh, presence on the moon. But here's a chronology of uh, human presence on the moon over the last um, uh, few years. Now I want to tell you a bit about the Center for Excellence in Mining Innovation, which is a non-for-profit organization based out of Sudbury, Ontario. Uh, you know, our vision is to solve the challenges of the mining industry by making the future happen as soon as possible. And our mission is to advance innovation in a way that makes mining better, not only financially, perform financially better, but perform better for the environment and also perform better in how we impact the communities that are touched by mining. And another important piece here is to make sure that mining is respecting the environment the best way possible. We have a network that we are running here at SEBI called the Mining Innovation Commercialist Accelerator. It's a $40 million funded project uh, with a vision, as you see here, to create a national mining innovation network. And also you can see that it's all to do with accelerating the commercialization of innovation into mining. Well, one really important fact about the MICA network is that we have a national presence. So for this cross Canada presence, uh, which is um, going to allow us to tap into the innovation ecosystem uh, across the country. One second, audio is good. Sorry, I'm just checking the chat box to make sure everybody's okay. I think we're good. All right, perfect. Uh, so moving on, it's important for everyone to understand how SEMI views innovation. You know, we do view innovation as a business asset. And we believe that if you're not innovating, you're actually losing value. So it's almost like there's a depreciation and an inflation that you're chewing away at your company if you're not innovating. But when you look at the technology readiness levels, you know, we do play a bigger role now on the later stages of 
uh, the technology readiness level, simply because we actually want to see innovation enter into the industry. We do believe in step change, which is you know significant change, and sometimes significant change happens when you combine more than one technology. And we also believe that you know research has a role to play in in creating the funnel of innovation that's going to make a difference moving forward. Our program that I mentioned, the Mica Network, you can see here that it's really leaning towards that late stage piece of the technology readiness level scale where commercialization happens, where we actually see the rubber uh, meet the road. This is sort of representing to you where our footprint is across Canada. And it's so important for us to emphasize this point because we really want the country to understand that we want to tap into the innovation ecosystem across the different regions across Canada, the different regions that represent different kinds of mining across the country. You can see here in the West Coast, we've got BRIM, and BRIM is um, at UBC. We also have Intech, Intech Alberta, All Sands area in Canada, Alberta, and we've got Sask Poly, Soft Rock, Uranium Mining uh, on, the, on, on, the, on, the, on the West. And then coming to Manitoba, Ontario, we've got Semi and Mars Innovation. And then we we'll move to Quebec, we've got Group Misa, uh, and then you move over to the East, the part of Canada, we've got College of North Atlantic in Newfoundland. And so we do have a presence across Canada tapping into the innovation ecosystem as it pertains to mining. So what I'd like to do now is hand it over to Matthew, who's going to be speaking to us about uh, CSAs and their role in um, this initiative. Matthew, I think I unmuted you, please go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Chamarai. I'm very pleased to be with you today. Uh, je m'appelle Mathieu Jugard, je travaille à l'Agence spatiale canadienne. So I'm Mathieu Jugard, Senior Advisor, Planning, Engagement and Innovation at the Space Exploration Planning, Coordination and Advanced Concept Division of the Canadian Space Agency. Um, I have to admit right away, the main topic uh, of the webinar is about space mining. But uh, you might not hear about space mining from space people. Uh, the, what you might hear about is mostly uh, ISRU or in situ resource utilization. And um, I just put the definition here just for the sake of understanding. Um, it's coming from the International Space, Explor space Exploration Coordination Group or ISECG that you might hear uh, about a little further uh, down the presentation. Uh, ISRU is defined as any hardware operation that harness or and utilize local or in situ resources to create products and services for robotic and human exploration and sustained presence. So that definition implies that ISRU are meant to serve for space missions, uh, both uh, robotics and human, and this is really the primary goal of, the, uh, of such activities. Now, after uh, 50 years, uh, astronaut will soon uh, visit lunar uh, vicinity with the Artemis II mission coming up. And uh, further down, uh, Artemis III and beyond, uh, the, learn the lunar surface. Now, uh, the, uh, the Artemis I mission was really successful, 25 days mission without any human uh, uh, on the spacecraft, on the spaceship part. And now uh, the interest of the ISRU topic was raised significantly because it is expected to play a very important role for future long duration missions. Um, and Canada is a, an active participant uh, in the Artemis Accord. Uh, Canada signed the Artemis Accords back in 2020. Uh, Artemis Accords are a set of principles for cooperation and uh, in deep space exploration, including SRU activities. One of the contribution that we'll make to the Artemis program is the Canadarm3 that will go uh, next generation robotics for the Lunar Gateway, which provide an early critical element for sustainable lunar operation. And we also have uh, our astronaut was announced last week, Jeremy Hansen, which is part of the Artemis2 crew. Next slide, please. Now, um, Artemis 3 mission will go back to the surface of the moon, but post Artemis 3, there is a plan to build up incrementally an infrastructure to support longer duration missions. As mentioned, uh, ISRU is really expected to use local resources to extend those missions, and it also will reduce the cost of the missions by reducing the need for resupply from Earth. The Artemis program aims to go uh, back to the moon, especially to demonstrate some of the approaches and technologies enabling to go in, but even further. So going 
should be a pathway to Mars. That's uh, the, the currently uh, the plan. Uh, and more recently, NASA's Moon to Mars strategy. Uh, it's a document aiming to bridge the efforts being made during the Artemis program uh, and to, to bridge further down to, to Mars. Specifically refers to a lunar infrastructure goal, which is to demonstrate industrial scale ISR uh, capabilities in support of continuous human lunar presence and a robust lunar economy. Now, what you see uh, here is the timeline of the global exploration roadmap. Um, it is, uh, it's a product that is delivered by the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, or ISIGG, that I uh, spoke to you uh, about earlier. It's a collaboration forum made of 27 particip participating agencies, and its goal is really to advance the global exploration strategy through coordination of their mutual efforts in space exploration. The global exploration roadmap is really a key uh, deliverable. And the ISRU elements, that, that's the last version that you, that you have here, and ISRU elements are present throughout the timeline, which, except, which extends up to 2035 on the, on the far right of, of, the, of the timeline. So the intent is to start with uh, um, demonstration. Um, well, you can have the previous slide still. Uh, thank you, Charles. Um, yeah, so ISRU demonstration, small, small scale production, and eventually uh, going to full scale. And these elements basically uh, are uh, incrementally increasing the technology readiness level for sustained presence. Uh, many other agencies are also uh, working specifically on the ISRU topic. Uh, one, one important initiative is NASA Centennial Challenge, Break the Ice. It's all about learning the, about the presence on the moon, how to extract it, how to uh, assess it. Also, other agencies are working, so it's really a, an international effort. For example, Luxembourg Space Agency uh, has a world's first uh, innovation center uh, entirely dedicated to space resources, and as well as the Australian Space Agency, uh, which uh, has a site uh, shared with mining, automation, and AI expert. Those are uh, facilities to test and demonstrate technologies. Next slide, please. Uh, ISRU is also a whole of government uh, approach. Yes, many uh, agencies uh, across the world uh, did participate in order to identify uh, gaps in the technology um, related with ISRU. ISIGG did uh, publish in 2021 the ISRU gap assessment report with members from 12 countries. And it's re it really includes a complete review of the ISRU technology gaps uh, from the different aspect. Uh, in Canada, we had participation from NRCAM. Uh, they were participating with the CSA representatives. And the Canadian Min Mines and Mineral, Mineral Plan has identified the importance of leveraging space-based technologies to support innovation and increased technological efficiency for mining in remote and extreme terrestrial environments. Um, there's a potential for terrestrial mining to utilize and adapt its current technologies for use on lunar ISRU, as there are similarities between terrestrial mining and lunar ISRU. Canada's particular expertise in remote and isolated mining supports increased potential for this crossover. Now for my last slide, I would maybe like to emphasize a bit cross-sector collaboration. So Canadian mining sector has proven expertise in remote areas, harsh environments, and ultra-deep mining. And the ISRU spans across the whole mineral value chain, prospecting, assessing, extracting, refining, and processing the, the, the resources. Those uh, should be words that is uh, very appealing to the mining sector. Uh, your involvement is really critical in supporting the development of lunar mining and ISRU for future long-term space exploration missions. And uh, we tend to believe that uh, you should, the sector should get involved, especially to contribute to Canada's leadership role in space exploration. It can also help increase your own competitiveness through innovation and even give opportunities for, uh, for uh, new markets and even collaboration. 
And we tend to believe that Canada is well positioned to seize those future opportunities because of its long-standing heritage of its mining industry. Now, without further ado, I would like uh, to let the floor to Doug. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mathieu. My name is Doug Gorson. I'm the CEO of SEMI. I'm the network director for MICA. And I thought we would just explain a little bit of why we're here. You can see from the history, which I've grayed out there, we have no expertise and have not been involved in the International Space Station or the Canada Arm or the Lunar Gateway. Uh, all these things in this particular uh, paragraph are before we became involved. And we've only become involved because of the next uh, paragraph, which is targeting mining. And our expertise is in mining. My own personal expertise is about 40 years, and we have several other associates with roughly the same amount of experience across the globe, not just in Canada and the Arctic parts of Canada, the temperate and the Arctic zones, but also in arid countries, tropical countries, every condition that you can imagine where mining takes place on Earth. We have uh, colleagues and uh, associates who have personal experience of those conditions and what has to be done in those places. And in many of those places, just like on the moon, if you have a problem, you just can't go back to the shop and buy the thing you need to fix that particular problem. You have to have a set of creative skill sets that will solve some of those problems in situ. So what we're focusing on here today is the extraction of lunar resources for utilization on the moon. We're focused on the in situ resource utilization and the current focus, majority of the focus is on the regolith the very fine dust on the surface of the moon and the water ice that exists on the moon. And these resources are intended to be used to build and support a human presence on the moon. This discussion for today, at least, is not uh, talking about exploration to Mars or other orbital bodies, as interesting as that may be, uh, nor is it talking about extraction of lunar resources to return them to Earth. There's almost nothing on the Earth, on the Moon, that we don't have on the Earth, and it would be extremely expensive to bring it back for use here. And neither are we interested in extraction of asteroid resources uh, to return to the Earth either, as, as interesting as that may be. But we do recognize that the extraction techniques and technologies that we're going to have to develop to operate on the Moon will have multiple applications and may well have applications for people who want to uh, investigate uh, resources on asteroids and on Mars. So that's why we recognize that that's an overlap, but our primary focus is on the next slide, Charles. So is the conditions we're gonna meet on the moon? We probably all, already know that, of course, there's no atmosphere, no liquids. Uh, not everyone knows, however, that the lunar day-night cycle is 29 Earth days and uh, in the middle of the day, in the middle of the moon, it's about uh, every daytime period is about 14 and a half Earth days, and that's about 350 hours. And the nighttime period is the same period, 348 hours. But the temperature goes from about 120 degrees centigrade in full sun at the equator to about minus 230 degrees centigrade, two weeks at a time. So when you saw Charles mention earlier that uh, all of our visits to the moon so far have been relatively short-lived. Uh, they've also been located in places where we're close to dawn or dusk, so that the people who are on the moon are not exposed to full sunlight, 120 degrees centigrade, because there is no breeze to alleviate uh, the discomfort on the moon. Uh, it's a very, very different place. And so the two pictures of the moon you can see is you can see the white areas, which essentially are the anorthosite type rocks, granitic type rocks. And those are the highlands and the black areas that you can see in the pictures there are what are called the mare. And they're essentially basaltic lava flows on the surface of the moon. And there are very few of those mare uh, deposits on the far, side of the far side of the moon, the one that we can't see from earth. Uh, I just thought I would show uh, a gibbous moon, which shows the part of the moon that is lit up uh as as it as we go around the sun and of course it goes from the full moon to no moon and that's when uh, the far side of the moon is actually facing the sun so every part of the moon gets those daylight and nighttime temperatures in its own cycle 
So the next slide goes on to our next topic, which is the resources, the crustal rock, the North Pacific, felsic rocks and the basalt, basalt, basaltic mafic rocks. It's a rocky surface covered with ejected material from the meteorite impacts. The regular left is extremely fine dust, so fine that it actually has a, a static attraction to itself. So it's quite a difficult material to work with. And that is pulverized material from the meteorite uh, impact. The water ice, there are very, very small amounts in the regolith, and they may be accessible by separation processes. There are larger volumes concentrated at the two poles, the North Pole and the South Pole. Both have significant amounts of water ice, and I've called them uh, as if they are stored in pools, but the pools are completely frozen, so there's no liquid on the moon. It's all either uh, solid or it very quickly changes to a vapor and disappears. So, and the purpose of being interested in the water ice is to be able to produce oxygen and hydrogen. And so for those of us who have a lot of experience in just digging holes and digging material out of the ground, this is where our expertise comes in. So in terms of focusing on the regolith uh, and water ice, we're looking at the collection, transportation and processing of those materials. I always tend to put mining in quotes because I think it's very unlikely that we're actually going to use the kinds of mining techniques that I'm familiar with on the moon. We will certainly be using extractive uh, efforts, but the kind of equipment that we use on Earth today is almost certainly not going to be what we use on the moon. Uh, we will require built infrastructure to host the facilities that we're, that we're going to use uh, to operate these processing systems. And the vehicles that we're going to use and the equipment that we're going to use on the moon is going to have to be small, light, and very effective, and completely autonomous. Because unlike some of the movies that we've all seen, we're not sending miners and we're not sending drillers to go do drilling and extraction techniques as we do them here on Earth. That is a fantasy, and we shouldn't be at all misled by that fantasy. So although we have some ideas inside SEMI, on what that equipment should look like and how it will be done. Our principal interest uh, in talking to you today is to find out what you think the future of operations on the surface of the moon will look like. And so uh, we have some ideas and we think if we can collectively pull together all the ideas that are out there into one uh, pile, then we can actually make a great deal more progress than we will if we try and advance things on our, on our own. And so that's where we are. And now I'm going to hand it over to Dale Boucher, who's going to continue with some more details about the moon and water ice and the resources that we can move to. So thank you very much. Over to you, Dale. Sorry, I had to find the unmute button. Hi, my name is Dale Boucher. I've been working on uh, space mining technologies for over two decades now. Um, and I'm working with SEMI on this CSA project. Uh, Douglas was exactly right. We're not going to pay uh, to have an astronaut on a joystick watching a drill operate uh, on, on the moon. Uh, in 1972 terms, which was the last uh, later uh, Apollo missions, an astronaut cost about a million bucks an hour. Much as I'd like that job, I, don't, I just don't see it really uh, being realistic in terms of uh, what we're going to be doing. All right. So what we're looking at is a, um, a, a mosaic map of the North Pole of the Moon. And um, what we found over the past number of years is that, is that there's a lot of water on the Moon. It's not as dry as we thought it would be. As Douglas said, it was mostly concentrated in the poles, North and South Pole. What's interesting is that the total amount of ice that they found in the North Polar region uh, is all within about two meters of surface. The same thing is happening in the South Polar region where in the, the, the water ice is thought to be within about two meters of surface. The reason they say that is because the orbiter that took all these pictures and all these with all these sensors cannot penetrate more than about two meters of the lunar surface. And so all the signatures that come back say, uh, yeah, well, this, there's water there, we think, but it's, uh, it's within two meters of the surface. And there's a lot of water. As of 2016, there was something like 60 million tons of water. Uh, and 
what that means is that if we converted all that water into shuttle fuel, we could launch a shuttle per day for more than 2,000 years, just from the water that's at the North Pole. The South Pole, it is turning out, is a, has a little bit more water to it. And I don't have numbers for you on this one, and I wouldn't want to bore you anyways. So what does this water really look like? Uh, you know, where is it sitting? So next slide, please, Chamonai. This is a uh, uh, microscopic pictures of the actual Apollo samples that were returned. These are particles of, of the lunar dust that Douglas was talking about. It's very fine. You notice the scale, you know, they're all sub, uh, sub 100 micron size particles. And the water sits as ice attached to these particles in these, these little holes and these little valleys and these, these little clefts in the, in the particles themselves. And the water is in the form of ice. Now, the average water concentration is about 5% by weight, um, which means that, I mean, it's pretty good. If it was, that was gold, that'd be an awesome ore body. Uh, you know, it's, we certainly not get 5% uh, per ton um, in, in, in any of the gold mines in, in Canada. But the, the water that's there on the moon within the first two meters is about, on average, about 5%. Next slide. So this is a NASA slide that was put together to try and define how much oxygen is required. And as Douglas mentioned, you can take water and you can use very simple uh, DC voltage and break the water into hydrogen and oxygen. It's called electrolysis. Uh, we did it all, I did it as a high school experiment. Most of you probably have seen that done. Uh, and, and it's a very simple process to, to crack that water into hydrogen and oxygen. Once you do that, you can use the oxygen for breathing. You can use the hydrogen and oxygen and recombine it to provide the most powerful chemical propellant uh, that we know of to, to date. So NASA said, well, by weight, uh, oxygen is heavier than hydrogen. So we need somewhere, you know, by the time we're getting down to, to uh, later on in the, in the, in the cycle that uh, Matthew was talking about, we're gonna need somewhere around 50 metric tons of oxygen per mission uh, to the moon. Now that's not an awful lot, but when you add that to the 9,000 tons, uh, or the nine, the nine tons that they need, you've got about 60 tons of, of uh, water that you've got to extract. I mean, some simple back of the napkin kind of calculations and what that translates to uh, is about 5,000 metric tons of excavated regolith per year is what is estimated to be required by the time you hit this, this what's called single stage to NRHO um, about uh, on the right-hand side of that little green square. So it, suddenly those numbers are no longer science experiment numbers. Um, um, you know, do, trying to do this at a lab scale, trying to produce that kind of, of uh, tonnage of, of uh, water uh, and, and process that tonnage, those 5,000 metric tons of, of regolith in a year is, it cannot be done in a, in a beaker and it cannot be done with, with just one little, uh, science experiment. It, it really needs some real well thought out process to be able to achieve these results. Next slide, please. So we're really talking about mining. Doug doesn't really like the word mining because it's not mining as we know it, but there are some similarities. Um, there are um, also some uncertainties here. We, for example, we're not really sure about what the resource looks like. Is it, there are seven forms of ice, for example, that exist at, at absolute, uh, close to absolute zero temperatures, minus, colder than minus 150 Celsius. And we're not sure what the ice form is really that is adhering to these, to these pieces of, of, of regolith, these small micro-sized regoliths. 
So if we don't know really the form, then we can't really figure out how to extract it very well. So there, there's some uncertainty that we've got to sort out. Um, we've got to think about uh, a little bit about the technology itself. How do we how do we excavate this stuff? We don't know, for example, if these particles are cemented together like a clay ice or whether uh, they are just free spirits and you, know, and you get you know uh, X number of, of micrograms of water off each particle of, of regolith. So how do you mine this stuff? Uh, we're not definitely not going to put you know a, a caterpillar D8 uh, on the moon. That, that just doesn't make sense uh, largely because it's just too darn expensive to get it there and, and it won't operate anyways. Um, but we, we do need to think about the basic principles of the mining aspect, the geotechnical and geochemistry that we understand in the mining industry very well. And how do we start adapting this to, to work in space? There is a, um, a need to know about the customers and, and what's our market growth. Uh, the, the, by bootstrap, by, by taking small little bite-sized steps in the space mining thing, you can actually bootstrap your own terrestrial market. And uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but it, it does force development into uh, a real world situation. So rather than you know a bunch of people sitting around dreaming up uh, ideas and, and then saying, hey, that was great, let's have coffee again next week. Uh, you, you can actually, you can actually uh, develop in a very real sense, some uh, innovative uh, approaches to, uh, to solving these problems that we've got. Sustainable operations is a big deal. Um, you know, at 50,000, or 5,000 metric tons per year uh, in order to have any long-term um, presence on the moon, then that's every year just to supply NASA. You've got to produce those 50,000 kilograms of, of, of water. And uh, that ignores the potential from other agencies, whether that be uh, European Space Agency, Japan, China, um, perhaps even commercial organizations. Uh, it doesn't take very long to start seeing that by uh, just looking at simple trickle down economics from the mining industry, for example, uh, you know, that, that the, the support required for this long term human uh, presence on the moon is going to, is going to drive a market for, uh, for the development of larger volumes of, of uh, product. And, and how do you make that sustainable? Uh, again, we only know what's down two meters below surface. Sounds a little bit like, to, like an open pit excavation activity to me, but um, who knows where we're gonna go with this. And, and we've got some regulatory issues that we need to deal with. The, the, there's some legal frameworks, there's property rights, there's uh, uh, simple things like, you know, the, the, the National Instrument 43101, how do you do due diligence? How do you prove that you've actually got uh, a capability to extract this stuff? How do you manage your claim? How do you manage your, uh, your uh, communications? These are all issues that, that are just, the, the agencies are just starting to look at, but the mining industry has been dealing with in many fashions for decades. Next slide, please. So this is a, a, a slide that I stole from NASA. And uh, the green check marks are the things that NASA seems to think on the left-hand side are things that NASA seems to think are well in hand. Um, I have a slightly different opinion. Um, but the little yellow hands are the things that they know they have to, they're going to have to work on. And, uh, but what they're, really interested in is how do they get collaboration with innovators and investors and how do they collaborate more specifically with the mining industry so that they can deal with things like equipment requirements infrastructure how do you how do you build a road uh, and, uh, you know energy required nobody knows how to get enough energy into these uh, potential mining sites and by the way the potential mining sites 
are in what are called permanently shadowed regions, which means they see something less than 90%, uh, sorry, something less than 10% of sunlight in the entire lunar day. So over 29 days, they might get maybe two days of, of, of indirect sunlight. Uh, so how do you put a, how do you put energy, uh, you know, megawatts of energy into, uh, into this kind of uh, operation and uh, without, without solar cells, I haven't figured that one out. It's possible there's small modular reactors, but um, it's kind of the same problem that we've got here in the mining industry. How do you get, you know, how do you get a significant concentration of power into something like the ring of fire? Transportation uh, is a is a big issue. They still haven't figured that one out. Um, you know, everybody's looking at rovers, and uh, um, you know, I, I'm I'm not so convinced that a rover is necessarily the 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 tool that is going to be used to transport large amounts of of uh, regolith around. Um, location, environment, adaptability, level of autonomy. There's a big one. Uh, as I said, uh, the astronaut in, in 1972, an astronaut cost a million bucks an hour. You, and you're not gonna put an astronaut on the moon with a joystick. You're, and you're not gonna have him on the earth with a joystick because the command between the start and the stop, the command of, uh, of a, if you wanted to transmit it from the earth to the moon would take three seconds to get there. And you know so much for e stops and, and and that kind of thing. So you've got this latency. You've got a very low bandwidth system. The low bandwidth is very similar to the early leaky feeder systems, leaky feeder systems we had in the mining industry. And so what that means is that the autonomy that you have to build into this equipment has to be extremely high. Um, and it, it's you know a lot of AI and probably machine learning will go will go into this. Uh, type of effort. Maintenance and logistics requirements. How do you change a spare tire on a rover on the moon? I don't know. I, I don't know how to do that. I don't, we, we can't do it here, but if we could figure out how to do it here, we could probably figure out how to do it there and vice versa. And then there's environmental impact and regulations, which are, of course are, everybody's uh, aware of those um, uh, in, in terms of, uh, I mean, the good thing is we're probably not going to have diesel fumes on the moon. Uh, so I guess based on that new regulation that just came out today or yesterday, I think we're we're probably a little bit ahead of the ball game. Great. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is my last slide, and we'll probably go into questions. So here are some new opportunities for lunar exploration specific to the mining industry. The 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 gap assessment report that Mathieu referred to that was produced by ISEC-G identified some key areas that needed operation. And, and I, I alluded to those in some of the earlier slides. What's missing though is all the other stuff that the mining ecosystem presents as a normal day of business. Things like regulatory, uh, issues. How do you adapt regulatory reg regimes for space? Is there a flow through shares type of adaptation for those that are investing? How do you claim stake? How do you claim stake a claim robotically so that it, it is uh, defensible? Uh, how do you do automated assays? Uh, you know, some some of the companies are are doing some of that kind of stuff with with uh, um, XRF uh, type of, of, of systems and uh, being able to compare it directly back to an assay and, and, and uh, calibrate it that way. But how do you do this on the moon? And, and how do you, so, so claim staking is a big issue, investing uh, stuff, due diligence. In terms of mineral exploration, um, standoff prospecting, using LIBS or, or some other kind of non-contact method of, of, uh, of being able to, uh, do a spectrographic analysis on, on, a, on a particle. The problem you get into is sometimes we have to get down below the surface. So, um, you know, a LIBS is only as good as it will only touch the surface and, and you can't get below the surface with LIBS. Uh, one of the problems they've got right now is low altitude data sets. Uh, as you know, uh, and, and because I live in Sudbury, I see this on a regular basis. You know, you see a helicopter flying over with magnetometer or, or some kind of, of, of sensor 
uh, below it. You can't do that on the moon. Uh, you have an orbiter, which is, you know, 100 kilometers up, uh, or you have something on the surface. So that medium, that da data set that is produced by these low altitude surveys are not available on the moon. And somebody's going to figure out how to do that. It can that be done by uh, inferencing, perhaps, um, but certainly data fusion techniques that we use in the mining industry. Everybody knows what a GIS system is. And, uh, you know, the, but the data fusion that is unique in the mining industry is something that uh, the, the, the folks at, in the space sector are just starting to look at and go, oh, that's kind of neat. We should probably do that. Sample drilling. Um, there's, not a, there's not a sample drilling technique that I know of that goes beyond about 10 meters of depth on the moon. Why? Because you can't, you've got uh, temperature issues to deal with. You've got cuttings issues to deal with. You cannot bring rock oils and you cannot bring flushing water uh, to flush, the, to flush the, the, the cuttings out. So your sample drill becomes a mechanical device. And how do you produce a sample from more than two meters below surface uh, without doing this kind of stuff? It gets, it gets a little tricky really, really quick. Uh, geophysical surveys, geochemical surveys. These are all things that are done at an experimental stage right now, but need to be advanced. Uh, again, you know, using a lot of the techniques and know-how that the mining industry has, I think we could go a long way to, to solving some of their problems. Infrastructure, power systems, small modular reactors, that's the, big, that's the big deal right now. And there's actually companies that are working on small modular reactors that are about the size of a, of a desktop computer. And the big, issue, big difference being that the, the shielding needed to protect people uh, is what's taken up the bulk of the mass and the bulk of the, and the amount of uh, volume that, that, that these things consume. Well, it turns out that if you take an, a, a, a small nuclear reactor and bury it on the surface of the moon uh, in a robotic environment, you don't really have to care about shielding for people because there's no people around. And, and so now you can start dealing with, you know, what's the basic principles here? How do I get these, how do I get these power systems adapted for this in robotic environment? Power distribution is another one. We're not gonna put telephone poles up on the moon to move power around. So how do you distribute it? How do you move it from its generator site, generation site to the, the end user, whether that's a refining plant or just a recharging station for, for a rover? Uh, you know, that's, that's a head scratcher. Road maintenance. We all know that, uh, especially this time of year in Sudbury, drive over a road more than twice and, and you get a pothole. And uh, so how do you do that? How do you fix those potholes on the moon? Uh, it's, it's, not, it's not intuitive. It's not, you can't bring a paving machine there, um, but you got to figure out how to do it. Vehicle repairs, maintenance, you know, I, oops, Rover number 23 is down because the battery just blew up. Let's go put a new battery in it. Um, so how do, you, how do you handle that? Distributed autonomy systems, secure communications, data links. Uh, that, those, are, those are big deals. I, I certainly wouldn't want to be operating a plant, uh, an excavator on the moon, and suddenly have some hacker take over the communications and command uh, um, uh, and 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 send the thing over a cliff or 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 you know into a crater and and lose it. Uh, it costs a lot of money to get those pieces of machinery there. So the mining industry has been dealing with secure communications and, and data links for a long time. And of course, then there's uh, civil road civil works like roads and landing pads and bulk storage, all these kinds of things that uh, that we think of in terms of re our, our remote mining. Uh, and the space agencies are just starting to scratch their head on it and haven't really figured this out. In terms of mining, conventional or alternative transportation methods, excavation, drilling, these are all techniques that when you go back to first principles and we understand a lot about how to do that kind of stuff. Like I said, we're not gonna put a, a D8 on the, on the moon. It's just too big. We're not certainly not gonna put a, not gonna put a, a, you know, a three yard scoop or even a one yard scoop on the moon. Uh, it just, just, we just, weighs too much and, and uh, the support required to keep it running is just, is just too big. So how do we solve this problem? And in the process, can we 
can we improve our terrestrial environment a bit? The refining systems, control systems, process smelting, metals winning. Right now, the major, there are three processes that, that seem to be having a favor in terms of extracting oxygen from the lunar regolith. Uh, one of them is a very low efficiency process called the oxygen, uh, hydrogen reduction of ilmenite. And um, it's like a three or 5% efficient. There's a, a molten electrolysis and there's a carbothermal processes. The molten electrolysis uh, is a process that is being adapted right now. It is uh, for use in uh, aluminum smelting. Um, so this is a, a great example of spin back from the space industry back into, um, into the terrestrial environment. Um, and uh, carbothermal process is, is, is uh, a neat process that was very similar to spot refining. It, it refines or it melts in a very small area. Um, and it's gonna be interesting to see how that one works out uh, in terms of extracting oxygen. Um, of course, the byproduct whole thing about uh, refining is that when you produce oxygen, you end up with a, a, a byproduct. And, and for example, in the hydrogen reduction of ilmenite, ilmenite, as you probably know, is a titanium oxide compound uh, um, mineral. And so when you strip the oxygen off it, you're left with titanium. Um, all right, finally, there's, there's the support issues. And again, these are only examples of, of where I, I personally can see uh, where we can see uh, collaboration between the mining industry and, and the space industry simply by transferring some of that know-how from the mining industry into, into space. So in terms of support, mine planning, the, the space agencies haven't even thought about plan, mine planning or mining design, or how do you get procurement? How do you construct this, this, this pilot plant? Where are the logistics for this? How do you support this and, and, and keep it rolling? Uh, where's the financing uh, behind all this? How, how, how is this place going to be, this going to be uh, paid? Uh, is it going to be purely government funded? Is it going to be public private partnerships? Uh, is, uh, you know, the, the whole startup commissioning operations, maintenance, repair of a, of a, of a mine site is something again that the mining industry uh, understands and uh, does really well, and uh, that that has a, a and the mining industry has a world of uh, know-how that needs to be shared with the with the space mining sector so that we can support human presence on the moon, uh, and perhaps even uh, if things go really well, opening up to commercialization in the future. And that is the end of my presentation. Over to you, Chairman. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Dale, uh, Douglas, and Mathieu for the presentation. We're now going to move into uh, some questions that people want to get some more insight from. Um, I'm going to go first with a hand up from Edgar. Edgar, I'm going to unmute you and please go ahead and ask your question and please reference someone from the group that you'd like to answer your question. Edgar, go ahead. Hello. Thank you for a very interesting topic. Um, how easy will it be uh, to mine uh, helium-3 and bring it to the Earth? What do you think? Want me to take that one? Yeah, go ahead, Dale. OK, so helium-3 is, um, is a solar wind implanted volatile. And uh, it is, what that means is that um, it, it gets injected into the top 10 or 15 centimeters of the lunar regolith. It is not bound to anything. It just, it's just free floating there because it's, it's inert. And so uh, helium-3 can be removed from the soil by simple agitation. In fact, they found that that, that that was part of the problem with some of the Apollo samples that were returned was that the helium-3 was primarily gone by the time it got back. Um, just from the mechanical vibration of, of um, the launch from the moon and, the, and the, the re entry vehicle and all the other kind of stuff. So, there you can, uh, if you agitate the lunar 
regolith, you can release these particles and and scoop them up. Think of a giant Zamboni machine that, you know, that might be kind of a, a good way of doing it. The challenge with helium-3 is that while it is very uh, valuable in, in, in terms of, of uh, today's dollars per, per gram, that uh, there is uh, really not the market for it yet until somebody actually produces a, a viable fission reactor. And I think we're still decades away from that. Then the helium three is uh, oh, somebody's got an open mic. Then the helium three is uh, you know I I, I, I got to scratch my head and ask why you want to mine it. As Douglas said, we don't want to work look at mining and returning to Earth uh, any of this stuff right now. We're just talking about mining and in support of the lunar presence. Okay, thank you for that answer, Dale. I'm going to add over the next question to Oscar. Oscar, I'm going to unmute you. Please go ahead and ask your question. Yeah, thanks. Um, so question is for you, uh, Charles and Sammy, or, or Doug, you know, whoever, and also Matthew from CSA. So what what is the systematic approach here? Is this the first time, you know, we're getting together and kind of like show of hands, you know, who's developing mining technologies for space applications? type of situation or do we have a systematic way of capturing some of that effort we are developing a technology for communication that does not require gravity we want to talk to you csa and to be honest the australians are going super aggressive we're actually going to be working with australia this year but we want to keep this ip in canada and therefore we're trying to reach out to you this is great you know first conversation but you know i kind of i want to understand if there's a systematic approach in keeping Canadian IP for these applications in Canada. Thanks. Thank you for your question, uh, Oscar. Uh, nice to uh, hear from you. Uh, well, uh, currently CSA is investigating and exploring options for future lunar surface contributions. So we're really at the inception of the uh, of this topic, uh, basically. So. It's really early stage as of today. Uh, we're exploring options, and we would be very pleased to have a discussion with you uh, further down the road. So we can certainly uh, go through semi and uh, organize uh, something together afterward. So we'd be really happy about it. But then just do you want to go ahead and add some context to that as well? Yeah, just to say that, you know we, we have to walk before we can run, and so. We're in a situation where we can't actually dig a hole right now or drive for very far. So there are lots of things that we have to be able to do and do very well, reliably, day in, day out, before we get to many of these more advanced issues that we know that we have to get to. But it's not going to be a rapid trip because the basics have got to be addressed first. Once we have the basics, and we can be working on these things in parallel, it's not like we do nothing on communication in the meantime, but there are some very simple things that have to be figured out, like drilling a hole more than four meters long. Is, that's that's non-trivial. Uh, we think we have some pretty good answers to that now, but they still have to be proven out, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole, we, this is the first conversation for us to have, and we're really just starting it. So, to, the genuine answer to your question is no, we don't have a strategy. This was the initial conversation to see who was interested. It could have been half a dozen people. We didn't actually, to be honest, anticipate more than 200 people being interested in this conversation. So, okay, so that's wake up call number one. Lots of people are interested in, in contributing to this. And we really do have to think about how we're going to make this happen. You would actually have seen that on the next slide, but let's <laughs> stick with the questions. Let's go back to Charles for another question first. And you'll see at the end, the have you put up the last slide, Charles? No, up, no. We no, are no, in the questions. No, no, not yet. It'll come up That's in a second. Basically where we are. So carry on. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, uh, certainly, you know what, just to echo what Douglas is saying, this conversation must continue. And we will be getting back to people with how they can stay engaged with us as we move things forward. But it definitely is a conversation that must continue. There's a question here from the chat box. And I'll get back to you, Sal, in a moment. A question from Brandt, and the question is, is heat pollution from power generation water recovery vehicles expected to interfere with water ice collection? Dale, Matthew? <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab, Matthew, if you want to jump in uh, at some point in time, go ahead. But the, the heat, dis heat dissipation on the moon is problematic um, because it's a large vacuum thermos bottle. Um, so you have to deal with heat locally on, on, the, on the machine itself, which means that you have uh, radiator radiator films uh, fins um, you will have a heat management system on board um, and in some cases you want to protect that vehicle so that you or that that uh, particular uh, machine so that it is uh, survives the night for example nighttime temperatures get down to you know minus 230 celsius how does that how do you manage your thermal environment so that you can uh, you can uh, uh, survive that night and still wake up the next morning and, and go at it again. Um, so the, the water ice collection is a bit of a problem uh, because of the, the way that the, if the regolith contacts a hot excavator tool, whatever that might be, uh, then we can expect it some losses, uh, but I think the losses are going to be relatively small in overall terms largely because the regolith itself acts as a great insulator and uh, you won't get the, the heat transfer from the tool to the regolith if your sample is large enough. You're welcome. Do you have yourself on mute, Charles? Yes, and I'm suddenly speaking to myself here on mute. Uh, Edgar, do you have another question for us? Uh, it's not in your head. Just comment, Mr. Dale. That's why I was asking about uh, helium-3, because I saw some predictions that uh, during next five years, uh, fusion energy plants may be uh, possible already in the Earth. So you think uh, in the moon, we can find a high quality helium-3 to bring it and uh, use it in reactors? The, the, there is a, a huge debate there. Um, Jack Schmidt, uh, who was one of the Apollo astronauts, is a big uh, proponent of helium-3 mining um, and is, is looking for uh, ways to move that idea ahead. Um, and uh, I think that realistically, we've got to get to the break even point on a fission reactor yeah. before we even start thinking about, about massive uh, amounts of helium-3. The amount of helium-3 that we have on the Earth right now is probably sufficient to sustain the experiments that we have going. Okay, all right, thank you for that, uh, Dale. Uh, next, I'm gonna open up the mic and ask uh, Salah to ask the question and then I'll go to your question in the chat box. Salah, please go ahead. Hi, uh, Charles, Doug, Dale, and Matthew. How are you? Um, I have personally been in touch with uh, the Canadian Space Agency, people like Christian and uh, folks that are funding some of the lunar stuff right now, um, and um, personally pursuing this uh, front of uh, space mining or industrialization of space for lack of a better word, or, or, or ISRU to be more exact. Um, I'm really keen to understand what our plan is from a Canadian point of view. You know, I, I'm not getting the answers. And if this is something, as you said, Doug, the start of the conversation, um, it would be something really valuable if you could answer that right now uh, without further <laughs> um, So. Um, I'm really excited to hear what it is that SEMI wants to do, how it's going to be enabled to do it, and uh, what role, um, what you guys think, what role uh, the ecosystem needs to play and who's gonna be responsible for that. Well, I, I can't give you a, a hard answer to that, but I think there absolutely has to be a roadmap. And the roadmap has to be, we have to stop or we have to talk less about all the uh, fancy things we would like to do with the products that we expect to be able to find on the moon and process them until we can actually figure out how we can actually pick them up or dig them up. 
or move them from A to B more than 10 or 20 meters, because these are the basics that have to be overcome first. And it's not an afterthought. It's not, you know, just because we can do it easily here means we can do it easily on the moon. We can't. These are not uh, easy problems to solve, but there are problems that need to be solved first and problems that need to be solved second, third, fourth, fifth. That's what I mean by a roadmap. And that's what we have to get onto as fast as possible. You're quite right. There are other people in, in the world who are more aggressive than your typical Canadian. There are not many people in there who are more aggressive than me, but you know, that's just who we are. So I think we absolutely needed to get on a roadmap and de define the roadmap uh, as we see it. And, and then we're in a position to collaborate on e an equal footing with all the other people and their roadmaps. But step number one is to get a roadmap and it can't be helium three and it can't be, you know, some of the other things that are hot topics. It has to be absolute basics. I mean, anybody, it may be, it may be okay in Florida and California to talk about using battery vehicles, for example. Not in Northern Ontario, where it's really cold. If it's really, really cold for any length of time, batteries don't do well. So not really a good answer. And yes, we can use nuclear reactors, but how many are we going to have? Because if you've got one in one place, you're going to have one in the other place, unless you've got another solution. And there have to be other solutions because there has to be a backup plan. And so if you're going to go all that way and do relatively sophisticated things like digging a hole or drilling a hole, you have to have a whole bunch of backup plans. So it's not just a question of what's the first roadmap, it's what is roadmap B, C, D, and F before you get to any of the fancy stuff. And that's that's the beginning of this particular conversation. So I'm glad you asked the question, and I'm sorry I don't have a better answer. Well, thanks so much, Douglas, for that answer. Uh, folks, we are at the top of the hour here, and I want to walk, thank everybody for joining the call. People are dropping off already. Uh, but in terms of next steps, we have your contact details, so we will be sending out uh, a link to this recording with the slides and some potential short-term next steps. Thank you, everybody, for your time. Appreciate everything that you've done and come in the call. Thank you for the questions, and we will be in touch as we bring Canada's terrestrial binding sector to influence what happens next on the moon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot. Thank you.